What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about hyperaldosteronism. This is a part of our clinical medicine section. I really hope that you guys are enjoying these videos. They make sense, they help you. And if they do, please support us. Some of the simple ways that you can do that that really helps that YouTube algorithm is hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, do this for your benefit. I really suggest going down in the description box below. There's the link to our website. On our website, we have amazing notes. We have very amazing illustrations, thousands of quiz questions, and we're even developing exam prep courses. So go check that out and become a member. All right, let's start talking about hyperaldosteronism. This is a condition, thus the name, in which you're producing too much aldosterone. Kind of the opposite to this is the uh, adrenal insufficiency, particularly primary adrenal insufficiency, where this is hypoaldosteronism. So in this scenario, there's two types. There's a primary hyperaldosteronism and a secondary hyperaldosteronism. One is that the adrenal cortex is the problem. So in primary hyperaldosteronism, the adrenal cortex, you got three layers, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. The zona glomerulosa is the one that's responsible for releasing aldosterone. So in patients who have what's called primary hyperaldosteronism, they are producing too much aldosterone from their zona glomerulosa. What happens is, is we know that aldosterone works by acting in the distal convoluted tubule, reabsorbing sodium, reabsorbing water, secreting protons, right? But the other thing that's really important is that aldosterone levels are highly regulated by renin levels. So what happens is, is whenever aldosterone levels are high, they act on these cells in the kidney. You know there's these cells in the kidney? They're called the juxtaglomerular cells. And what happens is, is when aldosterone levels are high, the GG cells will sense that and say, hey, we don't really need aldosterone to be high anymore. We should stop producing renin so that we don't make angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and we don't make out any more aldosterone. And so what happens is, is you inhibit the JG cells. And when you inhibit the JG cells, you as a result drop the production of renin. And so if I lead to a reduction in renin uh, subsequently as a result of this, what I'll do is I'll lead to less angiotensin 1, less angiotensin 2, and less aldosterone. That's the concept of primary hyperaldosteronism. You have to ask yourself the question though, what's causing the increased production of aldosterone? Oftentimes, <coughs> it's usually some type of hyperfunctioning of the adrenal gland. And there's really three particular reasons why. It's actually not too bad. One is you have an adrenal adenoma. I'd say this is a pretty common one. It's not the most common cause of adrenal hyperfunction, but you have this tumor. And I think one of the biggest things to remember with this tumor is that it's unilateral. It's oftentimes like relatively benign as well, meaning it's not going to metastasize and spread all over the place. But it is secretory. <coughs> and what I mean by that is that this thing is literally gonna be pumping out high levels of aldosterone. So this is a tumor that's probably situated near the zona glomerulosa that's responsible for pumping out high levels of aldosterone. Now, the next concept that's actually going to be the most common cause of a hyperfunctioning adrenal gland is actually going to be adrenal hyperplasia. Adrenal hyperplasia. Now, with adrenal hyperplasia, what's really interesting in this one is that there is a thickening, there's an increased replication, there's more growth of the adrenal cortex, but it's usually bilateral. So with adrenal hyperplasia, the very interesting component of this one is that you will see this bilaterally. And it's usually going to be the most common cause. So it's gonna be the most common cause. So one of the biggest differences that you have to be able to recognize between adrenal adenoma and adrenal hyperplasia is that it is bilateral involvement in adrenal hyperplasia. So bilateral enlargement and replication of the adrenal cells. So you're gonna see significant enlargement bilaterally, whereas you only see this mass unilaterally. That's the big difference. Either way, this tissue is leading to an increased production of aldosterone. The least common cause of a hyperfunctioning adrenal gland is usually gonna be an adrenal carcinoma. This is also going to usually be unilateral. So you're like, okay, Zach, how do I notice the difference of this one between adrenal adenoma? It can be unilateral. Usually some of the imaging findings would show that it's again more calcified, more irregular, but this one is gonna be more malignant. So this one is gonna be more malignant appearing. All right, so by far, these are the two most common causes. This is gonna be a very uncommon cause of a patient developing something like hyperaldosteronism. So, 
We've surmised that an increase in aldosterone from the adrenal cortex with the subsequent reduction in renin helps you to think primary hyperaldosteronism, adrenal adenoma, adrenal hyperplasia, less common adrenal carcinoma. What if we get the labs back and it shows that the aldosterone level is elevated, but the renin level is also elevated? Start thinking about secondary hyperaldosteronism. It's the exact opposite. So for some reason, the patient's JG cells are hyperactive. They're stimulated. For whatever reason it may be, and we'll talk about that, but they are stimulated. And when they're stimulated, they pump out tons of renin. You know the juxtaglomerular cells, they're really important for being able to sense blood pressure, particularly blood pressure. They may also be stimulated by the macula densa cells in response to changes in sodium and chloride. One of the biggest things is whenever the JG cells are stimulated, usually by low blood pressure, low perfusion to the glomerulus, they release renin. Now, the reason why they'll release renin is because if they're sensing that there is poor perfusion to the kidney, they'll say, okay, well, I gotta get that blood pressure up. And so the reason why this happens is renin leads to the formation of a couple different molecules. It'll, it'll activate angiotensinogen, converting it into angiotensin one. Angiotensin one will lead to the formation of angiotensin two. And then angiotensin two will then stimulate the formation of aldosterone by stimulating what? by stimulating the zona glomerulosa to release aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So through this pathway, you'll increase angiotensin one, angiotensin two, and you'll stimulate the adrenal cortex to make more aldosterone. The whole concept behind this is that aldosterone will lead to increased sodium water retention. You'll increase your blood volume and increase your blood pressure and perfuse more of the kidney a little bit better. And then also angiotensin II will cause vasoconstriction to increase your blood pressure and increase the perfusion of the kidney. So this is kind of our like regulatory mechanism. We just have to start asking ourselves the question, why are the JG cells hyperactive and in increasing this renin angiotensin aldosterone system? So the primary thing here is that there is a increase in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity. And one reason is that there's a tumor of the JG cells or there's poor perfusion to the kidney that's leading to very high renin production. So let's talk about those two things. By far, this is the least common cause of renin secreting tumor. I really do want you to remember, this is very rare. It's very rare, it's not super common that you will see this as a cause but it is pretty straightforward that you have a tumor. So here you're gonna have Bowman's capsule. You'll have your efferent arterial. And here you'll have your afferent arterial. And then in here you'll have the glomerulus. And what we know here is that blood will flow through the afferent arterial. And as it does this, it moves through the glomerulus and then some of it may go out via the efferent arterial, but some filtration occurs here into the Bowman's capsule. Right here is where you have this juxtaglomerular cell apparatus. So there could be a tumor here, and that tumor is responsible for pumping out renin. Has nothing to do with poor renal perfusion, has nothing to do with uh, uh, macula densa cells or sodium chloride levels. It's all just a tumor that is pumping out high amounts of renin. So I think that's one of the big things that you have to think about with this one. This by far is gonna be way, way, way more common. And there's three particular causes that leads to this increase in renin and then subsequently an increase in aldosterone. One of them is called renal artery stenosis. And there is two causes of this. One is there is a disease that's called atherosclerosis <laughs> right? So you get some plaques that build up within the wall of the renal artery. And there's another one that's common in females. I'm going to abbreviate it. It's called fibromuscular dysplasia. It's common in like 20 to 30 year old women. These are two common causes. And basically what happens in this is that you see here's the renal artery. There's the renal vein. Look at the renal artery. See how it's narrowed? The lumen is narrowed. It's going to be really hard for me to get enough blood to squeeze through that and then eventually filter some things off at the glomerulus and then eventually make urine. So the end result here is that the perfusion to the actual glomerulus is going to be reduced. And as a result, with poor renal perfusion comes increased renin levels. 
And so your body will say, hey, I'm not getting a lot of perfusion to my glomeruli because I got something obstructing the flow of blood into the kidney. So I better release renin to increase my blood pressure so I can better perfuse the kidney. Oftentimes, one of the key things with this one is really listening for that brewery. Really assess for a renal artery brewery that may be present because of this obstruction in the vessel. All right, the second common cause here is gonna be heart failure. Now, there is two different types of heart failure. There is this heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. It's more common for you to see this one with a reduced ejection fraction, especially if it's very severely reduced. The reason why is that if you have some type of damage, right, to the left ventricle specifically, it's gonna be hard for you to generate a very good enough cardiac output to push blood out into the aortic circulation. And then from the aorta off the aorta comes the renal artery. The renal artery is supposed to be taking and perfusing the kidney. But if I have a very poor cardiac output, what's gonna to happen to my renal perfusion as a result? This thing's patent, there's no stenosis there, but there is a very reduced cardiac output. So as a result, my friends, I'm going to have a redu reduced perfusion, less blood flow getting to the glomeruli, less filtration, my JG cells will sense that and they'll release renin. So renin will be produced as a response of this poor renal perfusion. But again, you gotta have a really, really poor ticker or a very severe ejection fraction to have something like this. So think about heart failure as a very common cause. The last one here, this one's actually really important, is cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a very common cause for hyperaldosteronism. The reason why is in cirrhosis, patients get you know, fibronodular type of fibrosis that occurs near these vessels in the liver called the portal ven venules. And what they do is they compress the portal veins. When they compress the portal veins, it makes it harder for blood to move through the portal veins. And what happens is the pressure inside of the portal circulation builds up. And so if I have an increase and my portal pressure, so I'm gonna put portal pressure. This is what we refer to as portal hypertension. What our body does is, is it leads to, it secretes these little vasodilator molecules that try to dilate the actual portal vein to increase the perfusion through their resistance, but also they get into your systemic circulation, they dilate your entire systemic circulation. So we call this splanchnic vasodilation. This is when you dilate a ton of your, your visceral vessels. Problem is, is the kidneys do not like when you dilate the, a bunch of vessels. They're very stingy because they don't get perfused very well. So the kidneys respond to this and what they do is they undergo something called intense renal vasoconstriction. And whenever you constrict the vessels, of the kidney, this ends up causing a problem, which is if I squeeze these arteries, am I gonna get good perfusion to the kidneys? No. Am I gonna be able to filter things off across the glomerulus? No. And so the JG cells will sense a very poor perfusion because of an increase in renal vasoconstriction and they'll pump out renin to say, hey, let me increase my blood pressure so I can perfuse the kidneys better. So three reasons why you could have poor renal perfusion is you have a stenosis, you have a poor cardiac output, or you have intense renal vasoconstriction, which is respectively due to renal artery stenosis, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, and cirrhosis with portal hypertension. All right, my friends, at this point, we've now talked about hyperaldosteronism. Now what I need us to do is to go and say, okay, what is the complications that we can see from this disease? All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about the complications of hyperaldosteronism. We talked very briefly, right, about the pathophysiology. It wasn't too hard. Thinking about primary is so whenever the aldosterone's too high, reflexively, a drop in the renin. Secondary, renin's high, stimulates an increase in aldosterone. Thinking about if you have primary, it's an adrenal problem, adenoma, hyperplasia. Whereas if it's a secondary problem, it's due to a tumor of the JG cells or poor renal perfusion. With that being said, when a patient has hyperaldosteronism, they can present in a variety of ways. Oftentimes, one of the biggest ones for your vignettes is secondary hypertension. Why? Well, <laughs> it's actually pretty straightforward. Aldosterone really loves to work on the distal convoluted tubule. It plays a role within sodium reabsorption, potassium excretion, as well as proton excretion and a little bit of bicarb reabsorption. So whenever sodium is actually gonna be being reabsorbed, it depends upon, especially in the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule, 
we're really in the far distal convoluted tubule here, it really plays a role in helping and aiding in sodium reabsorption. So if aldosterone levels are high, it will really amplify this process. It will really, really amplify this process. As a result, you'll get an increase in sodium reabsorption. Now, oftentimes when the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is active, hyperactive, ADH is also gonna be produced in high amounts. ADH plays a role in the collecting duct and increasing water reabsorption. So having an increase in sodium, and oftentimes if ADH is present, an increase in water reabsorption often occurs. Now, when you reabsorb lots of sodium and water, what happens is the blood volume goes up. When blood volume goes up, that often will proportionally increase the blood pressure. And this is usually how these patients will present, is they'll present with very high blood pressure. The key thing here is that they'll present with a hypertension that's refractory to multiple antihypertensive agents. So what do we refer to this as? It's common that they present with what's called refractory, refractory hypertension. And what that is defined as is having high blood pressure that is resistant to three or more anti-hypertensive agents. So if a patient is young with high blood pressure, they're on three plus medications, you really wanna start thinking, do they have secondary hypertension? With that being said, a common thing that you may also see in combination with the refractory hypertension, which helps you to cue off to think about hyperaldosteronism, is again, we already know this mechanism that aldosterone works by increasing the expression of sodium potassium ATPases, it increases the expression of ENAC channels in the distal convoluted tubule, and so as a result, you will increase the reabsorption of sodium. We already discussed this. So this process will definitely be stimulated. And if we're stimulating this process, you're gonna increase the reabsorption of sodium into the bloodstream. This is referred to as hypernatremia, especially whenever the sodium rises enough that it becomes a sodium level greater than 145 milli equivalents per liter. Oftentimes, this is usually a lab value. Hypernatremia may present with an altered mental status or delirium in some sorts, but oftentimes it may be an incidental lab value and it may not be very, very high, okay? So hypernatremia, hypertension in combination with hypokalemia, really think about a patient who may have hyperaldosteronism. The concept behind this is the exact same. So you know how we said that aldosterone plays a role within sodium reabsorption? It also plays a huge role in potassium excretion. Because again, it helps with the increased expression of what we call sodium potassium ATPases and then potassium channels on the interluminal surface. So now, if aldosterone's present, normally what it does, it helps to be able to secrete potassium into the urine. If there's way more aldosterone than usual, it's going to really elevate this process and will really stimulate the secretion of potassium into the urine. As a result, the potassium levels will drop and the patient will develop hypokalemia because we're going to be excreting it out of the body and into the urine. Now, when a patient presents with hypokalemia, this can present with ECG changes. And I think this is important to remember, we talk about this a lot more in the renal lecture, but oftentimes with hypokalemia, as it starts getting lower and lower, less than three as we go farther down, you start seeing changes such as T-wave inversion. Then it may progress. And sometimes from here, we may even see some other changes like these things called U-waves. So it may go from a T-wave, then it may progress to what's called a U-waves, these abnormal waves that kind of come off of the T-wave. And then finally, the highest risk complication as the potassium continues to deplete is you may have what's called a prolonged QT interval. The problem with a prolonged QT interval is you increase the risk of a very malignant and scary arrhythmia. And this is called torsades de points. So increased risk of, I'm gonna put TDP, torsades de points. Patient comes in, hypertension, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, with ECG changes, be thinking about hyperaldo. With that being said, if you wanna add even another component to this, which is helpful, is metabolic alkalosis. The concept behind this is that usually, the distal tubule, there's different types of cells, 
right? Like you, holy crap, we have what's called alpha intercalated cells and they play a big role with them also contributing to the acid-base balance. But when aldosterone levels are really high, we will secrete lots of protons. So this process here will move lots of protons from the DCT and we'll secrete them into the lumen and they'll go into the urine, right? So this process will definitely be exacerbated. We will have high aldosterone stimulating proton excretion. So we'll then do what to the protons inside the bloodstream? Well, as you drop your protons in the bloodstream, we start seeing problems here. Like what? When protons go down, what happens to this subsequent change in pH? Well, they're inversely proportional. So as a result, I should start seeing an increase in the pH. So what we'll see is that usually, as we have an increase in pH, the patient will start developing a alkalosis. Oftentimes, this is a lab value. So when patients have metabolic alkalosis, usually what you do is, is you would find this on the BMP. So you would obtain a BMP, and what the BMP would show is that would show as a result when pr pr protons go down, bicarb goes up. And so what you'll see on their BMP is you'll see a very elevated bicarb level. And then if you were to obtain a gas, a blood gas, an ABG or a VBG, oftentimes we obtain this via ABG or a venous blood gas, this would show the pH. And oftentimes we'll see that the pH will be subsequently elevated. And this would support the diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis. Oftentimes we just need a BMP. So with that being said, patient comes in, they have hypertension refractory to multiple antihypertensives, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis, think about hyperaldo. Now let's go into the diagnostics. All right, how do we diagnose this? It's really coming down to if it's primary or if it's secondary, right? But also I just need to know if the aldosterone's high. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get an aldosterone level, but I'm gonna couple that with the renin level. And oftentimes we can look at a ratio between these two. So if the aldosterone's high, all right, that doesn't really help me. I know that it's high in both of them. What's the renin level? The renin level's high. Okay, that means that it had to come from the kidneys. So this is probably a secondary cause. Now, if I look at the ratio, oftentimes if this is high and the other one's high, they kind of will end up relatively canceling each other out. So if I have a normal, like plasma aldosterone renin ratio, okay, this is definitely secondary. And then I just gotta go thinking about which one it could potentially be, right? But if the aldosterone level's high and the renin level's low, oh, this definitely suggests primary. And then I gotta remember that in this particular situation, I take the aldosterone divided by the renin, this is gonna cause a very high plasma aldenin, uh, aldosterone renin ratio, usually greater than 20 or greater than 40. This is indicative of primary hyperaldosteronism. And then you have to start thinking about the potential causes. So for example, for secondary, maybe I wanna think about a tumor, maybe I wanna think about CHF, cirrhosis, renin, uh, or renal artery stenosis. For primary, I wanna know if it's an adrenal hyperplasia or an adrenal adenoma. So what I'll do is I'll just confirm one more time. I gotta be very, very careful to make sure that this is truly primary hyperaldosteronism. So I'll do something called a more of a confirmatory test. And what we do is we give this patient salt. Usually it's either in saline or it's in sodium chloride tablets. What this should do is you should get into the bloodstream and increase the sodium chloride within the bloodstream. Now when sodium is high, it should naturally tell the adrenal cortex, stop making aldosterone right? Because we don't want to reabsorb any more sodium. However, if they have an adenoma or hyperplasia, it doesn't matter. They don't care about the sodium. They're going to continue to pump out aldosterone. So if aldosterone levels remain high, despite the sodium being delivered to the patient, it's not suppressing them from releasing aldosterone. And so what will happen is they'll have high aldosterone in their blood or high aldosterone in their urine. And that would be indicative of a failed adrenal suppression test. So if their urine and serum aldosterone is elevated, it means that it's primary, they got a tumor or hyperplasia going on. So then what do I have to do? I gotta figure out if it's uh, hyperplasia or if it's some type of adenoma. So oftentimes what we do is we get an adrenal CT or an MRI and if I see bilateral involvement or I see potentially unilateral involvement, I can already get an, have an idea of which one it is. But to be even a little bit more specific, what we'll do is we'll get an adrenal venous sample. So what I'll do is I'll take blood from one of the adrenals and one from the other adrenal. And I'll look at the aldosterone levels from both of the adrenal glands. 
If the adrenal gland causes aldosterone levels when you take it from one adrenal gland, so let's say I take it from one side and the other side, and only one of those sides, whenever it's coming out of the adrenal gland, aldosterone level is high. That suggests a unilateral process. That's an adenoma. That's Kahn syndrome. But if I take blood from one adrenal side and the other adrenal side, and it's increased bilaterally, it tells me that this is a bilateral process, and that has to be adrenal hyperplasia. And that's one of the most confirmatory ways of being able to determine this. All right. All right, let's now talk about the treatment of hyperaldosteronism. So what do we got to do here? Well, the first thing you have to figure out is, do they have an adenoma or hyperplasia? The reason why is that actually kind of guides their treatment. For adenomas, it's actually oftentimes you can try to medically temporize these patients by giving them aldosterone antagonists. But oftentimes the end goal is to just to cut out the tumor because they're going to continue to produce aldosterone. For hyperplasia, though, you don't have to be as aggressive and go and cut out both of their adrenal glands. With, you know, an adenoma, oftentimes it's unilateral, so you can't cut that and you have the other adrenal gland. If you do hyperplasia, you get cutting out both adrenal glands. So you don't want to do that. You really want to try to avoid that process and suppress the hyperplasia. So ways that we'll do that is we'll give them things like spironolactone or eplernone. The concept behind this is that they're going to block aldosterone. So they're producing lots of aldosterone here. That's going to go to the kidneys and basically is going to try to, you know, say, oh, I'm going to reabsorb sodium. I'm going to secrete potassium, secrete protons, reabsorb bicarb. Oh, I'm going to give something that's going to block all of that. I'm going to give spironolactone and eplerdone. They're not going to be able to reabsorb sodium. They're not going to be able to secrete potassium. They're not going to be able to uh, secrete protons as often and as too intense as they usually do. So because of that, in these patients, they'll pee out a lot more sodium, they'll not secrete as much potassium, and they won't secrete as much protons. So because of that, they won't develop hypernatremia, they won't develop hypokalemia, they won't me develop metabolic alkalosis and secondary hypertension. All right, my friends, that covers hyperaldosteronism. I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys really did enjoy it. And I uh, love you, thank you, and as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.